to talk about supporting those with psychosis within healthcare settings. Um, and we bring this up in the context of integrated care because primary care clinicians might be the initial point of contact and an ongoing point of contact for many people with psychosis. Ideally, primary care clinicians would be the ones to recognize some symptoms and have a direct means of referring to specialty treatment and early intervention team. When that happens, that path is both clinically effective and very cost effective to the system and definitely produces better results. Um, the, Lancet, the Lancet Psychiatry Commission looked at some of the behavioral risk factors for persons with psychosis um, and a bunch of other mental health disorders, but we pulled out schizophrenia specifically in here. Um, individuals with schizophrenia are much more likely to have an alcohol use disorder. Um, they experience much higher rates of smoking. Most do not meet physical activity guidelines. Um, they tend to be sedentary for about 11 hours per day and consume about 400 more calories of the general population per day. They also have significantly reduced sleep time and quality of sleep. Um, when it comes to persons with first episode psychosis, you see similar things. So 27% uh, having a alcohol use disorder or alcohol dependence, about 58% using tobacco, which is much higher than the prevalence when looked at match controls. Um, they're less active than individuals with long-term schizophrenia, which is interesting um, when you consider the 11 hours of sedentary behavior uh, in, you know, piece, you know, the larger population of persons with schizophrenia. Also experiencing significantly reduced sleep time and quality. They do note that there's an insufficient amount of evidence so far on the sedentary behavior, even though we know that they're less active, and diet. Importance of early identification can't be understated. Without it, the, the clinical and social outcomes are often poor. About 25% of people who experience a relapse of, do so within the first three years of treatment, and residual symptoms are common to those individuals. So those, this leads to a lot of risk factors for additional poor outcomes that are difficult or possible to modify. So we want to be able to get people in early, identify with the, that there is that there are symptoms, and get them into some type of comprehensive, you know, well-rounded treatment as early as possible. However, there are barriers to that. Um, some of the barriers being stigma, a stigma being really one of the biggest ones, a lack of emotional or instrumental support from the family or social network, a lack of insurance, um, time, energy, a lack of insight or anosognosia, something that Crystal is going to get into a bit more, and paranoia. Uh, some of, you know, the stigma is so when you think about stigma and you think about a person with psychosis, what is the first thing that we think of? What kind of language pops into our head when we think about a person with a psychotic disorder or a person with diagnosed with schizophrenia? And it's similar a bit to when we found out, find out a person has addiction. So what's, the, what's the terminology and the language that's used to describe people with addiction disorders? Um, so we see this a lot in the media. And it's something that we have to be mindful of because the, the way that we talk about things definitely can have a huge impact on you know, how people are internalizing stigma and how we approach the persons with a particular mental health di diagnosis. So stigma is a huge thing. Um, psychotic disorders are obviously it have, are considered to be one of the most stigmatized conditions. And disclosure about symptoms really, or the lack of disclosure, really it gets into a relevant in form of internalized stigma that the literature shows can impact and delay health seeking treatment. Um, people have a, a notion that you know there's some internalized feelings of shame, possibly internalized feelings of fear, and people can experience discrimination and expect discrimination even if they've not had the direct maybe they've not experienced it directly yet. Um, but from seeing the way that people are treated you know, in their communities or on TV, uh, there's a lot of fear to disclosing what symptoms are going on, and that, that really can lead to a lot of delay in the outcome. And when, we, when you see the fact that early intervention can be so helpful, that's why we need to really start to help to address stigma first. So, Crystal, I'm handing over the slides to you. You just tell me when to move forward. I will. Thank you, Nicole. I appreciate what you 
um, presented, especially around stigma. Um, prior to the Best Center, I spent many years in an outpatient mental health setting. Um, we did good work. The agency continues to do amazing work. Um, but stigma was an ongoing issue for many individuals and to get them in the door and to keep them in the door. Um, and we talked about the perceived stigma. There was a psychiatrist and he's not with us anymore. He would talk about a genuine paranoia. And so individuals just based on what they've seen and they've seen how others were treated, um, that could contribute to them not engaging in treatment. So if you can just click one more time. So as I just stated, I was in a mental health agency for numerous years, um, and we simply didn't talk about anosognosia. Um, I don't think it was intentional because we talked a lot about insight, we talked about denial. It wasn't until about six months to a year before I transitioned to my current position that it slowly started creeping up in conversations. And the reason we're presenting it to you today is because, next slide, please. According to Dr. Amador and his colleagues, what we know about anosognosia is that it impacts approximately 50% of individuals living with schizophrenia. And as a side note, Dr. Amador has also done work with individuals with bipolar disorder, and it impacts about 40% of individuals with a bipolar um, diagnosis. And the thing about anosognosia that people don't under, always understand is, again, it's not denial. The individual simply doesn't understand that they have an illness. Um, and Dr. Amador, I looked, I was going to say he was just at a NAMI luncheon, luncheon, and when I looked, that was last May. Days are just running together. Um, but nonetheless, he talked a lot about his work. Um, he also has an Institute. He's written numerous articles. He has a book, um, but he also has a 17 minute TED talk. So when you have a little time, I encourage you to look him up. Um, and one of the things that clicked for me through his presentation last May and then also through his TED talk was he compared anosognosia to a delusion. He kept stressing that it's a symptom, it's not a coping mechanism. And that's when it clicked for me because we were taught that over and over that you don't um, you don't push uh, back against fixed delusions right we know that people are just more likely to just dig in they're gonna might disengage um, and what dr. Amador stresses is that you know he said at the very beginning he recognized that the language he was using the language his colleagues were using was not helpful and so that allowed him to shift and focus more on motivational interviewing which I imagine many of you are already doing in your practices and really the goal shifts as well, and ultimately wants the focus to be more about helping the individual to accept treatment, whatever that treatment might be, and not necessarily the diagnosis. Next slide, please. And so Becker et al., they um, provide us some potential tools to support those living with psychosis. And these are simply some tools, some concepts we're presenting to you. Um, I look at it like an a la carte. All of them may not apply, but just really asking you to look and pick, a pick and choose um, to decide what might be relevant to your particular practice. Next slide, please. So in regards to accessibility, and again, I know I'm not asking you to necessarily pick up your practice and move it, just something to think about. You know, thinking about the convenience, the location, um, I, Becker et al. talked about, uh, is it child friendly? So people living with psychosis are multi-layered and some of them might be caregivers of children. And I thought about COVID and how that impacts individual worlds. I mean, we're actually at the end um, of the school year, but even just two weeks ago, a month ago, some individuals that typically might've been able to come during the day when children were in school, that then might've become an issue. So is it child friendly? Um, are there bus passes available or is it on a bus line? In regards to psychoeducation, again, it depends on your role. Some of you might actually, you know, complete a 50 minute session, 55 minute session. But even if you're in a more primary care setting, but you have the relationship and maybe that person trusts you, 
you know, still looking at providing some psychoeducation about this illness, especially if it's very new, you know, talking about contributing factors. You know, they, we can't control if our grandparents possibly had the illness, but we can talk about stress and how stress can contribute and we can possibly manage that. Looking at, you know, how can we help individuals not blame themselves? If you're talking about a younger individual and there's parents involved or a guardian and helping them understand that, you know, psychosis isn't a result of bad parenting. And Nicole already talked about stigma. So just helping them to normalize the experience, you know, helping them that many people are apprehensive. Um, when I think about, you know, I'm one of them people like I love social media until I don't love it. Um, so there's really some good information, but there's also a lot of misinformation as well. So just helping them normalize their experience. Next slide, please. Now you may see case management and think, Crystal, I'm not a case manager. But I think anyone that's working with human beings, especially people are just, you know, going through, people are losing jobs, having their hours cut, you know, just having some concrete resources for those individuals. Um, 211, that is something that's really simple. Um, most communities should have access. You simply just type in 211 for your county, and there is a wealth of information, you know, whether someone needs support with housing, transportation, and clothing, it's all right there. And again, in regards to crisis planning, whether you're working with individuals that have psychosis um, or not, you know, always just having some hotline numbers available. Um, I actually have my little bracelet on for the text line, and I simply had gotten that from my local uh, mental health board. So just having like some concrete resources available as people are coming in and out of your healthcare um, setting. Next slide, please. I just heard this uh, quote this week, actually. So I added it um, to our presentation. Um, so Becker et al., when they're talking about these practical tools that you can use, um, they also talk about cultural acknowledgement. Um, we're calling it cultural humility. Um, and Dr. Kleiman, he um, is known for saying, psychiatry must learn for anthropology that culture does considerably more than shape illness as an experience. It shapes the very way we conceive of illness. Um, and I actually heard this by way of Dr. Justin Chen, so I did want to acknowledge him. Next slide, please. And the reason we're talking about cultural humility is because, again, as we said earlier, many individuals living with psychosis have multiple identities. And I don't know if we always acknowledge that. Um, so Dr. Chen, he works um, a lot with international students, specifically Chinese students. Um, and so he was talking about how it was important to acknowledge that the individual is an expert in their lived experience and things that are impacting their world and also in regards to their goals and then also their strengths. And so we want to recognize how their understanding of psychosis fits into those experiences and then their expectations. So what do they want out of treatment um, rather that's, you know, we're talking about therapy or just a more of a traditional primary care setting as well. Um, and then understanding the importance of doing our homework. So again, Dr. Chen was talking about international students, specifically again, Chinese students, and relating it to COVID. And one of the things that he said was, it was so simple, but it was so pointed, and I think we needed to hear, was that Racism against Chinese students didn't just start. Racism against Chinese Americans didn't just start. And so just using um, a Chinese student, a Chinese American as an example, and if that individual is coming through your practice as someone maybe you've seen once, you know, maybe before they come back doing a little homework because there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history there. And then ultimately you're setting that foundation and you know, helping with the engagement process so that when the individual comes back, they're gonna notice um, and then understand that they ultimately can talk about their own experience within the context of the bigger culture. Next slide, please. Disable the label. This is my favorite slide. Um, and what Myers at all, this actually come from individuals 
um, it wasn't necessarily about anosognosia. It was more about working with older teens, young adults, and this them finding their power and pushing against the label. Um, you know, everyone is able to look up information. Everyone has, not everyone, but many people have these little computers in their pocket and they present it for treatment. So they present it for treatment, but ultimately what worked for them and kept them more engaged was when they were able to partner with the provider, work on their treatment goals and minimize the label. So that is all we have for today. So thank you. Uh, for being here and listening to us talk about